begin by telling you, you something that all of you suffer every day in Bangalore city. The first image of uh, Bangalore or the meme or the impression about Bangalore when the word Bengaluru is mentioned these days is of traffic. Bangalore has been declared the, by some studies, not everybody, we have competitors that we should not be proud of. Bangalore has been declared by some studies as the most traffic congested city in the world. It is certainly one of the most polluted cities in the world, consequently. Now I'm saying as engineers we should have been looking at solutions based on transportation engineering, which actually is not of building roads, but actually studying mobility patterns, locating people, you know, to reside closer to their places of work, and because of there is so much attrition in jobs and migration from one company to the other, to create clusters where, you know, with the mobility, from moving from job to job, you also move from where you live to another place where you live, you have should, have should have had plug and play residential systems perhaps. Like in the Nehruvian era, we had this model of colonies, ITI colony, BL colony, HL colony. So before we look at the solution side, I'm not going to address the traffic problem. I want to take it up to say something else. Let's look at some simple numbers. See, the traffic in Bangalore, the registered number of vehicles in Bangalore city has doubled from 10 years ago till now. You know, we are, we are now counting about 10 million vehicles, registered vehicles. 10 years ago, we had about 6,000 buses you know, from BMTC. Even now, we have around only 6,000 buses from BMTC. See, you know, there's an instinctive appreciation of what is wrong, correct? See, there's a, the mayor of Colombia, of Bogota in Colombia, you know, he said once that a rich country is a place where the, you know, a developed country is a place where the rich will use public transport, he said. You think about this. Now look at some other statistics. Last year, on Independence Day, BMTC to encourage people who feel that traveling by bus is beneath their dignity, you know, to encourage them to taste a travel by bus, BMTC declared that on Independence Day, travel will be free. More than six million passenger trips were made. BMTC's ridership was, was an all-time high of 6.1 million that day. So the Bas Pranikara Vedike and many such organizations are suggesting that if you make BMTC travel free, then you know the things will improve. Certainly BMTC is expensive. It's probably the most expensive transport, bus transport system in India, Indian cities. I don't know if Traveling free is the good thing, okay, let's, but consider it from the other side. If six million people are able to use, if it's not actually six million people, it's probably three million people doing a trip up and trip down. So you may say roughly six million people. And if each of those trips, okay, would have meant that two people put a car by, travel by bike or car, that's not true. Actually, everybody typically is an individual rider, but even then, there would have been 1.5 to 2 million private personal vehicles off the road. How much space will 6,000 buses occupy on the road? Maybe half the number for cars or double the number for cars, you know? How many cars are there in Bangalore? There's an average of 180 to 200 cars per thousand population. You know, Bangalore has got the highest average per, per capita GDP in India, remember that. So it will keep growing. You know, the Bangalore's economy for the last 30 years has been growing at 11 to 12 percent. 
if we keep growing and we hit the US average of say 600, 800 uh, cars per thousand population, actually the problem will be solved because nobody can move after that. See the point I'm driving at is this, this idea of personal agency of free will, I'll do what is good for me, is a very dangerous idea. Because you may think that for, for, a, for a while it looks like I'm doing better than others. But actually when you're stuck in traffic, remember you're the cause of that. Shall I say we are the cause of that. I mean I also have a car which sometimes I bring to the city. I came by metro now, okay, but usually I come by metro but sometimes I bring the car to the city. So we are all implicit in this, implicated in this. My point is this. The choosing the right idea, I think in the coming era, which you will inhabit, I'm 61 years of age now, when you become cross 60, it'll be a very different world, correct? I mean, you all know that. Anyone who has a sense of the future, you know what it is, right? We are not future ready. We are past blighted. You think the people, the planners, government don't understand all this, they understand. They are not going to do anything to make things better in a hurry. Even if one person is well intentioned, let us say in a cricket team, one person or two or three persons are in the system of taking bribes for match fixing. The good guys must just keep my mouth shut and carry on, even if they want to serve the country. You understand what I am saying? It's a very hard system. My point is that if you can communicate the idea with numbers, with data and show that being self-centered is no longer profitable to the self, what does it mean? BMTC's revenue per annum may be about 3,000 crores. For a population of say 12 million people, India, you know, Bangalore registered close to 9 million voters in the last elections. Which we have to assume they are adults, hopefully gainfully employed. What is 3,000 crores for a population of that size? If you are willing to spend 75,000 crores, you know, to build elevated roads, every government that comes gets so excited about building flyovers and elevated roads. It's quick turnover of what I won't tell you, but you know, you understand, okay? It's not that they don't know. It's just that they are invested in this, in this system and they don't want to change. And you have to force the change, those of you who are young, educated, especially those of you who have logical minds, which is why you are in engineering courses. 3,000 crores is nothing. Even if you make it free, the government will have to spend less on road building, white topping and so on, okay? because these buses occupy, I don't know, the figure I had 3-4 years ago was less than 1% of road space, do you know that? 5,000-6,000 buses occupy less than 1% of road space. Imagine if you doubled, see now with metro, everything has work from home, everything, the ridership of BMTC's average daily ridership has come down. It's come to about 3.5, you know, million per day. But even so, it's a large, very large number. About 40% of ridership, of commuting, it is covering. If you just doubled this, you know, the city has a very large saving. You are paying for all those things. You are paying for the bad engineering. You are paying for the pollution, you are paying for the kickbacks, you are paying for it. We need to look at a way of stopping it and I think we have to look at how we look at what is aspirational, what is good for each of us. Quickly I will touch upon the other things because this is an introductory idea. If you, if you did housing in the way I said, why do you come to this city? You come to the cities to study. Many people who come from other places to Bangalore, they are complaining about the traffic and the pollution and all kinds of prices. They don't leave. The 
they buy houses and stay here, then nobody's going to leave. Typically, that's how the city is. You come here for work. Many of you, if there's a holiday weekend, you leave the city. The city gets empty when there's a holiday weekend. It's not just students. I'm saying people are settled here for many years. They will say, Nammane Alli De. That's what they will say. You know, this is not home for them. People who don't love a place, don't have ownership of a place, are not going to look after the place. Which is why politicians are bad for us. They get elected elsewhere and come and rule here. You know. It should not have been like that. But this idea is that if you could, li if could live in these modules of houses where you work, is where you play and where you live. It would have been a very great idea, right? Millionaires should not have been going in Hosur Road traffic, turned off, you know, hours into work and turned off hours back. They should have lived on the other side of Electronic City, owned Bermudas and played golf there, correct? And cycled to work. They have set the bad example for us. That is because the aspirational idea was to live in the city and exploit the suburb or farmlands. That's what it was. We have to st stop this. Let's look at COVID. How many people were there in uh, Bangalore city for COVID? We don't have any estimate because those workers or contract workers, they're not registered. But we know a lot of them left. There are various figures. You know, the, it, is, it is believed that about 140 million migrant workers are there in India or were there in India, in India at that time. And it's speculated that maybe 10 to 15 million migrant workers left. Not just Bangalore, from cities they went back to where they were. Suddenly there was a 3% or 4% increase in agricultural labor statistics in India. But statistics in India, you know how they are generated. We don't know if it's true. You people have to do some really big data stuff and get statistics you know, into correct space in India, reporting of statistics. But let us say it's certainly in, in millions. Where did they go? They were forced to go where? To places where they felt safer. Just like you go for holidays, festiv festivals, to some place where you feel you belong. They also went to spaces where they felt they belonged. What, the, what were those spaces? Native spaces. Native means where they were born. Nate means root natura is where you are born, is birth. They went there because they felt safe there. So I am saying in the past couple of centuries we have thought that you can go and make your karma bhumi somewhere else. But I think we have to probably look at a future we need to go back where you belong. It doesn't mean we regress into narrow ethnocentric cities. But we are ethnocentric for sure. Let's not pretend we are ethnocentric. We should find ways to talk to each other. Which is why there is so much struggle in saying, why didn't you learn Kannada if you come here, for instance. You know, because one ethnocentric imagination is challenging other ethnocentricities. Correct? So I'm saying, if you have a community where you feel natural, which also comes from Nate, huh? where you feel natural, you know, that is the community which you will care for, where you will not allow bribes to happen, where you will feel safer, and you'll understand that you are safe when everybody is safe, that you are satisfied when everybody is satisfied. More or less, I'm saying, it's an ideal, but we all strive towards the ideal. That's the point of it. But I'm going to ask you another question. Think about this. What does the COVID vaccination mean? For a moment, we'll drop which vaccination is good, which is not good. You know, we don't know. Okay, but we'll drop that for now. But what does the vaccination do for you? It gives you personal safety. Correct? But the universal vaccination gives you personal freedom. Think about this. If there was no universal vaccination, you would have to still be in some kind of a lockdown. None of us here is wearing masks. I'd say one or two. I'm carrying one in my pocket. This is because, you know, you feel relatively safer and free to move around. Correct? That happened because of universal vaccination. 
See, this is the idea of community. You are safe when everybody is safe. You are free when everybody is protected. It's because you follow traffic rules that traffic can flow smoothly. If you jump the red signal, you are blocking the road somewhere and causing a jam. Correct? The thing is, you give up some of your freedom, which is taking a vaccination for instance, you give up some of your self-will a personal agency so that you can operate in the collective. Nobody wanted to do this. But COVID did a very funny thing. What it did is it came by airplanes, you know, to India. And it went by probably cars to villages. It's not a thing that came from squalid poverty of India to homes of the rich. It's from the squalid homes of the rich that, you know, COVID went to the homes of the poor. There's a great paradigm shift in the world. Think about this. There's a transformative idea of the world today. None of us can live like we lived before. COVID is an illustration of what will happen when something hits you that you did not bargain for. And what is the biggest one like that in front of us? All of you know, Nothing, not, not your progress, your GDP, nothing will matter in front of climate change. Nothing will matter. We have unseasonal rains. We have sudden flooding in cities. You know, we have sudden heavy downpours. We have cyclones we have never heard of before coming from the, you know, from the west coast of India. We have landslides that are unprecedented. Somebody threatened yesterday that there will be a very big land earthquake in Uttarakhand. Actually, earthquake cannot be predicted. I guess somebody who wants to be famous who is saying that, okay? If we knew, you know, we could fix it. We don't know how to make a successful film, otherwise we will, everyone will be writing very good scripts. So we can't do that. We did 322 films got censored in the last calendar year. I don't think even 10 movies will recover their money. We don't know. Actually, our hubris is too much that we are always predicting. <laughs> but actually, we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen by the end of the day, really. We don't know. But if there is an earthquake, if some, some of you visited Uttarakhand, you know, Masuri, and all this, there are doing all these hilly places, if you've gone, you see the precarious way in which they built houses and resorts and buildings where they should not have been building. The Himalayas are a very young mountain. It's still growing. It's in, it's in its infancy. You know, the tectonic plates crashing into each other is still happening. It's still pressing. At some point of time, it will shudder. That's all earthquake is, right? But it, it shudders in geological time. That's it. Not in the way I showed it now, okay? Now, when that happens, can you imagine the disaster? Are we prepared for it? Are we prepared for climate disasters? Look around the world. Look at Australia. Actually, New Zealand is now going through a problem, correct? Auckland is going through a problem. I was in Australia for five months. There were four flood, four times flooding in Australia happened. Four times in six months. Unprecedented. Some of the water is still not receded. What I'm trying to say is these are highly developed countries. If you do Australia, Google Australia, they'll say it's a highly developed country. The California fires have not been put out in the last five, six, seven years. The drought in California is about five, six years old already. There's no water. All the billions of billionaires of the world, including one who tried to sponsor 70 vaccines, have not found a cure for COVID. Although gleefully, you know, our hero of the past, now I look at him with some suspicion, let the person remain unnamed. No. We now look at him gleefully predicting other, other para, you know, pandemics. Pandemics and maybe profit-making things for countries like that. But look at India, where we live. In India, 
the government had to spend on the poor, they had to give vaccines free. We have crossed, right? We have crossed 200, um, 2 billion vaccinations already, 200 crore vaccinations we have crossed already. The bulk of it given free. Many of you will go abroad. It doesn't seem like the life is so hunky-dory. All the diplomacy of the world, all the knowledge of the world, white people to white people, they cannot resolve such a stupid war, right? My point is, we cannot live in silos anymore. A virus that grows somewhere can come here. And you don't know what you're going to do when it comes. As we know, we still don't have a cure. I'll finish with this idea. Tomorrow's world has to be ethnocentric with this understanding that the other also is entitled to her ethnocentricity. Only when we do that, we stop being self-centered and we, instead of personal gain, we choose the collective gain. We are all protected. Otherwise, you'll have to build very high walls, you know, if you live in a slum. It's not a great place, a slum. Even if you build high walls, it's not a great place to imprison yourself there. Thank you very much.